This LIT video will be about Group B Streptococcus infections in neonates. We will discuss the basic pathogenesis of GBS, the epidemiology of neonatal disease, clinical manifestation of the different forms of neonatal disease, as well as strategies for treatment and prevention. So Group B Streptococci are facultative gram-positive cocci that are grown easily. They appear on sheep blood agar at 3 to 4 millimeter gravide colonies with a narrow zone of beta hemolysis. The group B specific cell wall carbohydrate antigen is common to all strains, whereas a cell wall carbohydrate antigen allows their classification into serotypes 1A, 1B, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Group B streptococci have pillus like structures that are composed of protein antigens. The alpha C surface protein mediates translocation of GBS across epithelial barriers, and GBS can also use a paracellular route to cross epithelial cells by transiently opening cell junctions. The beta hemolysin of GBS forms pores that cause cellular damage by lysing epithelial and endothelial cells and compromising their barrier function. After invasion, capsular polysaccharides is a major virulence factor for GBS, allowing the organism to evade opsonization. Type 3 strains have a tropism for the meninges and the capacity of type 3 strains to elaborate high levels of capsular polysaccharide during growth may enhance their virulence. As you will see later, this is an important strain in GBS infection in the infants. Maternal GBS colonization is a primary risk factor for GBS infection in neonates and young infants. GBS colonization in pregnant women is generally asymptomatic. In terms of transmission, neonatal early onset GBS infection is acquired in utero through clinically apparent or silent intra-amniotic infection or rupture of membranes as well as during passage through the vagina. Evidence suggests that vaginal colonization with a high inoculum of GBS during pregnancy increases the risk of vertical transmission and early onset disease in neonates. After discharge from the hospital, neonates and young infants can acquire GBS horizontally from mother or colonized household contacts and go on to develop late onset bacteremia meningitis, or other focal infections. Depending on the method of testing, 15-40% to 40 of mothers can carry GBS in the third trimester. The incidence of early onset GBS that is within the first six days of life has declined by 70% compared with pre-prevention era baseline rate in 1993 when the ACOG guidelines were published recommending prenatal screening of mothers. In 2005, the incidence of early onset GBS was 0.31 cases per 1,000 live births. The incidence of late onset infection, that is 7 to 89 days of, an, of age, has changed little during 1996 to 2005, averaging at about 0.35 per 1,000 live births. Group B streptococcal infections is classified by age of onset. It is classified into early onset, late onset, and late late onset GBS. Early onset GBS generally presents at or within 24 hours of birth but can occur through day 6 after birth. Late onset GBS typically occurs at week 4 to 5 of age. As for late late onset GBS, it occurs in infants older than 3 months of age. Late, late-onset GBS infections are most common in infants who are born before 28 weeks of gestation or in children with a history of immunodeficiency. Presenting signs such as lethargy, apnea or bradycardia, and poor feeding are not distinguishable from those in neonates with other bacterial infections. Respiratory distress is usually prominent with chest x-ray suggestive of pneumonia or respiratory distress syndrome. Features that are, such as irritability and hyperthermia are noted more often in term than preterm infants, but can be present in both. Early onset GBS is commonly associated with maternal complications and commonly manifests as generalized sepsis, pneumonia, or meningitis. In more than 90% of cases, these clinical signs appear within the first 24 hours after birth.
The initial presenting signs are not any different from neonatal sepsis and can include lethargy, apnea, etc. as discussed earlier. The clinical syndromes that are most commonly associated with early onset GBS include bacteremia, without focus, pneumonia, and meningitis. The mortality rate is higher than in other forms of GBS and outcome especially worse in premature infants and in those who present with septic shock. Late onset infection can occur anywhere from one week to three months of life. The median age is 27 days. Affected infants typically present with a fever and may have a history of preceding or intercurrent upper respiratory tract infection. Other clinical findings include irritability, lethargy, poor feeding, tachypnea, grunting, and occasional apnea. Again, bacteremia is the most common, but patients can also have meningitis, pneumonia, osteomyelitis, cellulitis, or adenitis. Osteomyelitis is the most common in the proximal humerus. The mean age of diagnosis for arthritis is 20 days, and the knee and hip joints are most commonly involved. Late, late onset GBS infection occurs in infants more than three months. Commonly, these are premature infants. Among the risk factors are prolonged hospital, hospital course, likely related to prematurity, immature immune system, and the persistent mucosal colonization. Any newborn with signs of sepsis should receive a full diagnostic evaluation and receive antibiotic therapy pending the results of the evaluation. The evaluation should include a blood culture, a urine culture, a CBC, including a white blood cell differential and platelet count, a chest radiograph if any abnormal respiratory signs are present, and a lumbar puncture if the newborn is stable enough to tolerate the procedure, and if sepsis is suspected. The cerebrospinal fluid should be sent for cell count, protein and glucose concentration, and culture. Empiric antibiotic therapy should be initiated for the infant, and include antimicrobial agents active against GBS, including intravenous ampicillin as well as other organisms that might cause neonatal sepsis, such as E. coli. For further details on management of neonates, born to mothers with suspected chorioamnionitis or mothers with GBS colonization, please refer to the article by the American Academy of Pediatrics on Management of Infants at Risk of Group B Streptococcal Disease. The broad principles of treating GBS includes prompt, appropriate, antibiotic therapy, and supportive care. Once GBS has been confirmed as the sole causative pathogen and clinical response has been observed, after at least 24 to 48 hours of empiric antibiotics, the treatment can be completed with ampicillin or penicillin G alone. In terms of supportive care, management in an intensive care unit is required if the patient is in septic shock. Other forms of care, such as ventilatory support, Fluids and treatment of complications such as seizures or shock may be required. Women with GBS isolated from the urine at any time during the current pregnancy or who have had a previous infant with an invasive GBS disease should receive intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis and do not need third trimester screening for GBS colonization. All other pregnant women should be screened at 35 to 37 week gestation for vaginal and rectal GBS colonization. At the time of labor or rupture of membranes, intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis should be given to all pregnant women who tested positive for GBS colonization except in the instance of cesarean delivery performed before onset of labor on a woman with intact amniotic membranes. For circumstances in which screening results are not available at the time of labor and delivery, intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis should be given to women who are less than 37 weeks and zero days gestation have a duration of membrane of rupture more than 18 hours, or who have a temperature of more than 100.4 degree Fahrenheit. Women expected to undergo cesarean delivery should undergo routine vaginal and rectal screening for GBS at 35 to 37 week gestation because onset of labor or rupture of membranes can occur before the planned cesarean delivery, and under those circumstances, GBS colonized women should receive intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis. Women admitted with signs and symptoms of labor or with rupture of membrane at less than 37 weeks and zero days gestation should be screened for GBS colonization at hospital admission unless a vaginal rectal GBS screen was performed within the preceding five weeks. Women admitted with signs and symptoms of preterm labor who have unknown GBS colonization status 
at admission or a positive GBS screen within the preceding five weeks should receive GBS prophylaxis at hospital admission. Antibiotics given for GBS prophylaxis to a woman with preterm labor should be discontinued immediately if at any point it is determined that she is not in true labor or if the GBS culture at admission is negative, but they should get prophylaxis again when true labor starts. Women with threatened preterm delivery who have a GBS screen performed that is positive and do not deliver at that time should receive GBS prophylaxis when true labor begins. Make sure that these women are rescreened at 35 to 37 weeks again if they are found to be negative at the current time. Penicillin remains an agent of choice for intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis with ampicillin as an acceptable alternative. Penicillin allergic women who do not have a history of anaphylaxis, angioedema, respiratory distress, or urticaria following administration of a penicillin or cephalosporin should receive cefazolin. Antimicrobial susceptibility testing should be ordered for antenatal GBS cultures performed in penicillin allergic women at high risk for anaphylaxis because of a history of anaphylaxis with either penicillins or cephalosporins. To ensure proper testing, clinicians must inform laboratories of the need for antimicrobial susceptibility testing in such cases. Penicillin allergic women at high risk for anaphylaxis should receive clindamycin if their GBS isolate is susceptible to clindamycin and erythromycin as determined by antimicrobial susceptibility testing. So in summary, group B streptococcus are gram-positive cocci that are grown on sheep blood agar the incidence of early onset GBS disease has been reduced significantly after implementation of preventive strategies, which include universal screening of mothers who are 35 to 37 weeks pregnant. However, the incidence of late onset GBS remains the same. Sepsis and meningitis are more common in early onset disease, and focal disease and or bacteremia are more often seen in late onset disease. Beta-lactam such as penicillin and ampicillin are the first-line therapy. Quiz time. Question 1. A one-month-old infant presents with a fever and irritability. How would you classify the infection? The answer is B. Late onset GBS. Question 2. A four-day-old neonate presented with a fever of 39 degrees Celsius. Her mother was colonized with GBS but received adequate intrapartum prophylaxis. Physical examination was normal except for the fever. What is the best immediate management for this child? The answer is D. To do a septic workup with blood culture, urine culture, lumbar puncture, and empiric intravenous penicillin and gentamicin. Question 3. Which of the following is not a manifestation of GBS infection in infants? The answer is B. Conjunctivitis.